again, I'm excited to be here with all of you this morning and to have the opportunity to kick off our summer sermon series, Summer Smoothie, which all of that was kind of hard to say, (laughs) as we talk about the first fruit, the first ingredient, which is love. Hear these words from Paul's letter to the Galatians. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was young, I attended a Christian elementary school. And every six weeks, we had these two character qualities that would be assigned for that period of time, two qualities we were supposed to focus on and sort of cultivate within ourselves. And at the end of each six weeks, every teacher would pick from his or her class a girl and a boy who had exemplified those character qualities. And we would have the special chapel service where all those kids would be recognized. And you didn't know if your name was going to be called. It was a surprise, but they would tell your parents ahead of time. So if you saw your parents in chapel, it was kind of a clue. But it was very exciting. Everyone would get dressed up, and they would be called up on stage, and they would get this certificate saying that so-and-so has excelled in showing love or joy or peace or patience. Not all of them were the fruit of the Spirit, but a lot of them were. And we found it very exciting at the time, But as I look back on that practice now, it seems a little weird, Um, especially the six weeks when humility was one of the virtues, and then that person was called up to receive an award for their humility. But anyway, (laughs) the whole thing was weird because it seemed to make the pursuit of those virtues about achievement, about individual success, or maybe even about competition. It seemed like the opposite of the virtues they were trying to instill in us because the whole point of these qualities is not to build up the individual person, it's to build up the community, the body of Christ. But I think that today, as we hear that list of the fruit of the Spirit read in our achievement-focused society, sometimes we might look at that list in the same way. We might look at it and think, if we just try a little harder, we can get there. We can get to that blissful life where we feel love and we feel joy and we're full of generosity and kindness and faithfulness all the time if we just try a little harder. But these aren't the fruit of trying really hard. (laughs) They're not the fruit of doing just a little bit better. They're not certificates and they're not individual achievements. They're the fruit of the Spirit. Good fruit grows when a tree is healthy. When a tree is receiving the sunlight and the water that it needs, and it's rooted in and nourished by good, rich soil. The fruit is the sign of that. It's not forced to grow by the tree. It's it's a sign, it's a result of right relationships with the tree to its environment, to the things that keep it alive. And the fruit isn't kept by the tree. It's not solely for the use of the individual tree. It's really about a broader idea, because a piece of fruit contains seeds, right? So whether it's an apple or a pear or something like a pecan that falls to the ground and either decays there or it's eaten by an animal, those seeds scatter about and they create new trees, new bushes, new plants. So a healthy tree produces good fruit, which then produces more trees, and so on. I think there's something for us to learn in that as we begin this series. The fruit of the Spirit are the things that come from us, then, being rooted and grounded in and nurtured by and watered by the Spirit of God. The fruit of the Spirit aren't our individual benchmarks. They aren't checkboxes. Are we living as good Christians? They're instead the ways that we recognize that the Holy Spirit is active and present in us as a church community. As I said earlier, what better day to begin this discussion of the fruit of the Spirit than Pentecost, the day we remember how the Spirit of God rushed in and gave birth to the church of Jesus Christ. We may not today experience that rushing wind or those tongues of fire, but we know that there are ways that we still sense that same Spirit of God among us, and one of those ways is by the development of these fruits. 
And all of that doesn't mean that we don't still have some sort of role to play in cultivating these fruits. I think that we do. Because God doesn't force us to grow in God's image without our participation. But the beauty of this analogy is that it reminds us, first and foremost, that the Spirit of God is sufficient for that growth. That what we must first do is tune in to the work of the Spirit among us. One of my teachers from seminary wrote this. The Holy Spirit is both the power and the norm for life before God. The power and the norm. So the fruit of the Spirit in some way are standards, but they're also a promise. They're what faithful life in God calls us to, but they're also what God promises that faithful life will cultivate in us if, as Paul says, we keep in step with the Spirit. So all of that brings us to the first fruit, which is love. This was one of those sermons, um, as I looked back on the text that we had chosen, all your pastors, as we collaborated on this series several months ago, I looked at the text for today and I thought, oh no, because our other text, not the Galatians one, but the, the one about love is 1 Corinthians 13, like Richard mentioned. And where do you hear 1 Corinthians 13? Weddings, exactly which isn't bad, right? A lot of you probably had those verses read at your wedding. I know that they were read at mine. But the, the only danger is that, at least in my experience, we tend to use that chapter solely at weddings. And so in our minds, it might get tangled up with images of flower girls and bridesmaids and rings and table centerpieces. And because of that, we can easily take that 1 Corinthians 13 passage and we can over-sentimentalize it. They're words we've heard many times, every wedding of every friend you go to. And so you start to tune them out and you start to tune out what their meaning might be for us as a body outside of a romantic relationship. So today it's important for us to look at that text and sort of dislodge it from the wedding context, to look at all the other things that are happening around it in the Bible to more fully understand what Paul means when he speaks about love. I am not the sentimental partner in my marriage, which sometimes surprises people, I think, because I cry easily. I think that I pretended that I was more sentimental than I actually am for a while, maybe like the first year that Travis and I were dating, but over the subsequent nine years, the truth has come out, as the truth tends to do. So Travis is very much the sappy and sentimental one in our relationship, and I'm telling you this because he is not here today. He is participating in the work of the Lord along with Drew and Michael <laughs> in New Orleans. <laughs> I think that our two ways, Travis's and mine, of loving each other can be summed up by these two similar yet different signs. Um, maybe you've seen these on Pinterest or something like that. The first is this. I love you more today than yesterday, but not as much as I shall love you tomorrow. Aww. That's Travis. <laughs> Here's mine. I love you more than yesterday. Yesterday, you got on my nerves. <laughs> the danger of leaving 1 Corinthians 13 at the altar of the marriage ceremony is that we can start to read it simply like that first kind of love. When I think what Paul meant to do by that, that portion of his letter really has more to do with that second type of love, the messy reality of the kind of love that God grows in us as we are learning to live in community, both with those we've chosen to live with forever and those that we would rather not be stuck with. In that letter, Paul writes this. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. 
But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The city of Corinth was a port city with a transient population. And the community that Paul founded there was sort of a mixed bag, just like the city. There were people in that church from all sorts of racial and ethnic backgrounds, from all sorts of religious backgrounds before they became followers of Jesus, and from all sorts of social and economic spheres. And today, that sounds like a pastor's dream. That's the kind of community that you want to all be worshiping together. But for Paul, while good, it created its own set of issues. Because some of the Corinthians came from religious backgrounds where the spectacular was highly valued. Whether that was signs or miracles or some sort of omen or special gifts from the gods, those things were valued highly. And so the people became enthralled with what Paul refers to as spiritual gifts. And he talks about spiritual gifts in the two chapters that bookend 1 Corinthians 13. He talks about teaching and preaching and speaking in tongues and prophecy and many other gifts. The problem with this fascination is that people were really interested in which gifts were the most spectacular, the most showy, the most holy maybe, the ones that would give them a direct hotline to God that would elevate them above the average believer. And so the ones that possessed those gifts that they considered special or higher began to set themselves apart. They began to create factions within this melting pot of a church. They began to separate themselves. They began to create divisions. And so those divisions are the reason that Paul is writing this letter. So does this passage still apply to marital love? Of course it does. But Paul's purpose in writing this letter is writing to a church that had lost its way and trying to remind it of what that way was. You'll notice that many of the claims that he makes about love in that chapter are about what love is not, or what love does not do. Sometimes it's easier to define something by talking about what it's not, right? And that's what Paul does. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Jeffrey Jones says this about those middle verses. Everything Paul says that love is not, the Corinthians are. Everything he says that love is, they are not. And that fact would not have slipped by the Corinthians. They would have known exactly what he was talking about, exactly what he was trying to do with that rhetoric. Paul is drawing back on language he's already used earlier in the letter. He's telling them, love does not envy the gifts of another person. It doesn't boast in its own gifts. It's not unduly prideful about what it's able to do. It doesn't delight in evil, in injustice, in any form of discrimination, but it rejoices with the truth, the truth of equality for all in the body of Christ. In chapter 12, right before this, when Paul speaks to the Corinthians about the struggle with these gifts and the hierarchy that isn't real but that they're manufacturing, he says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, one spirit. And to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. The purpose of these gifts is not for you, it's for the common good. Then he says, and now I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. For Paul, love is the more excellent way of life that governs everything else. Love is not one of these spiritual gifts that they're arguing about. It's a way of journeying that supersedes all of it. Love is the first fruit of the Spirit. It's the highest expression of the Spirit of God because as we read in 1 John, 
God is love. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Whoever loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. So if we believe that God is love and we don't have love, then we don't have God. And all of this that we're doing right now is empty. And we might as well just go home. The message puts it this way in chapter 13. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I am bankrupt without love. Any and all of our striving, any and all of our efforts are counted worthless if they're not rooted in the love that comes from walking in step with the Spirit of God. No skill, no achievement, no talent, no gift is counted for anything if it's lacking connection to the one who turns us toward one another and opens our hands to serve like Jesus served. If Memorial Drive United Methodist Church has thousands of people in worship every single Sunday and if every single member is engaged in a Bible study or a small group or a Sunday school class, but we have not love for each other, it adds up to nothing. And if our church is known throughout the community for the ways that we serve, and if we give away money and food and clothing and household goods, but we have not actual love for the world, then we are, as Jesus said, like salt that's lost its flavor, fit to be thrown out. And the reason for that truth, Paul says, is this. Every single thing will pass away, except for love. Again, I like the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases this in the message. He says, love never dies. Inspired speech, preaching, and teaching will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding, knowledge, learning, wisdom will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth. And what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly. And the best of the three is love. N.T. Wright tells a story about Mozart or really Mozart's father. I guess he was also Mozart. But anyway, the Mozarts. (laughs) When Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was a young man, he would go out with his friends, and as young people do, stay up late, and get home in the wee hours of the morning. He would come home, and he would sit down at the piano, and he would, legend has it, start to play a scale on the piano. And as every note was played, it would get louder and louder and slower and slower until he got to the top, but he wouldn't play that very last note at the top of the scale. He wouldn't let it resolve. And then he would go to bed. The musicians among us are shuddering at this moment. And his dad, Leopold, would be upstairs sleeping, and apparently he would hear this in his sleep, and he would toss and turn, and he couldn't rest again until he came downstairs, groggily, and stumbled over the piano and played that last note. And then he could finally go upstairs and rest. N.T. Wright tells that story and then he says this, what we're concerned with here in this passage is the way in which Paul describes the call of love as an unfinished scale going ahead of us into God's future. The music of love, which will one day be completed, is therefore not just our duty, it is our destiny. Not just our duty, but our destiny both a call of God and a promise by God. Love is the music that draws us all forward until the completion of that last note. Love is the song of sanctification, of being made holy, of being remade into the image of God. Love is the grammar of the language of the kingdom of God, and without it, nothing else matters. 
Our gifts, our talents, our achievements are temporary. They're good, but they're temporary and they're transitory. And all the ways that we try to make a name for ourselves won't matter anymore. We won't need them anymore when we see God face to face, God who knows us as we are. Even our faith and our hope, the other two things that Paul names at the end of that letter, those won't be needed anymore either because the thing that we've had faith in and the things that we've spent our whole lives hoping for will be right there with us. And what is left will be love. This type of love that Paul describes, all the things he says about it, what it is and what it's not, what it does and what it doesn't do, these aren't the natural results for most of us, of living together in community with those like us and especially with those unlike us. This type of love doesn't mean that we'll always agree, just like the Corinthians. It doesn't mean that we'll always feel warmly toward one another. It doesn't even mean that we'll always like each other. It's about instead the ties that bind us to God and to one another because of the covenant of life that we have made through Jesus Christ. It's a love that invites us to love our enemies, to pray for our enemies, to turn the other cheek rather than seeking revenge, to use our own resources and our own privilege on behalf of those who cannot. This kind of love is a calling, and it's also a fruit. It's impossible by our own striving alone, but it's possible when we are together grounded and rooted in the Spirit of God because to know God is to walk in this kind of love. Carol Holtz Martin writes this, Christ's perfect freedom engages us in a call. That call carries obligation to neighbor as well as to God, to put up with the sandpaper of fellow congregants' wearisome ways against our own unholiness. To put up with the sandpaper of fellow congregants' wearisome ways against our own unholiness. That all of our sharp edges and corners may be sanded away until we look just like the one who creates and redeems and sustains us all. Friends, this is love. This is the love to which we are called. May we know it. May we walk in it. May we live by it. Until that day when all is seen clearly in the light of God face to face. May it be so. Amen. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you that you do not leave us to our own devices. You do not leave us as we are. But you promise to bring new life and breath and spirit to all of creation. Breathe into us this day that all we do and say may be rooted in the love you have first given to us that you call us to give to one another. Amen.